Hello online students. Um, I'm going to be recording the infancy now. Uh, it is afternoon for me. I just got out of church a little bit ago and I hope you're having a good afternoon, good morning, good night, whatever it is while you are viewing this. What you will have to have ready as you get ready to go through this lecture, you'll need your book, Pete's book, and you want to open it to chapter 10. You will also need two handouts that I have posted ready to go over. One of those is a, pediat a clinical tip, a simple way to remember pediatric vital signs, and the other is the immunization schedule for 2015. So if you will have those downloaded and ready, we will get started. I know you'd rather be napping. Me too. All right, let's go. Here we go. going to do this one just a little bit different. I'm going to uh, pull up this one with my note pages as I go along, uh, but you will have the PowerPoint that you can download and follow uh, as long, uh, long as we go as well. If you're looking at the handout, the clinical tip, a simple way to remember pediatric vital signs. Now, I don't know about you, but there is no way I would want to open the front or the back of one of these pediatric books and memorize all the normal vital signs for every age group. In fact, I would say it's pretty much probably impossible to do that. But they, uh, someone came up with a brilliant idea here of how to remember those. So if you look at the little box down here, if you can remember this little mnemonic thing uh, that's by, age, by 40s, really, pretty much, then it will help you to remember these as we're going along. You only need to remember four age groups, birth to one, one to four, four to 12, and over 12. Heart rate and respiratory rate should be written at the top. And on heart rate, you'll if you look there, it starts at 140. 40 is the key. And it goes down by 20 with each age group. So 140, 120, 180. Then when you get to respiratory rate, we start with the magic number again. <coughs> Sorry, 40. So it goes 40 and then it drops by 10 until it gets to the 12 year old and becomes 15. So it's 40, 30, 20, and then 15. Now for blood pressure, it does not have normal blood pressure on there, but for blood pressure, if you will remember, uh, 70 plus two times their age in years, so it has to be in years, two times their age in years equals the uh, lower end of the systolic blood pressure normal reading. That would give you the lower end of the systolic blood pressure reading. 70 plus two times their age in years, so I have to be one year and older to do this formula. 90 plus two times their age in years equals the upper end of systolic blood pressure. And if you know if they're doing okay systolically, then usually they're doing pretty good diastolically. So that's how you can kind of get a rough estimate of where they are systolically and if they're in that upper or lower range. So 70 plus two times their age in years is the lower end of systolic blood pressure. 90 plus two times the age in year, years equals the upper end of systolic blood pressure for norms. All right, so now let's look at the infancy. Wow, what a time. All of this information is coming from chapter 10 in your Pete's book. We know this is in a very exciting yet demanding time. Growth, we know, is an excellent indicator of overall growth, particularly during infancy. So that's what we're going to be focusing heavily on. Now we're also going to be looking at development. If you remember, growth and development, even though they're used inter intertwined and used interchangeably, they are absolutely, absolutely two different things, which we talked about when we talked about in the concepts. All right, so for your um, reading assignment, it was chapter 10. Bi uh, biological development, we know that growth is an excellent indicator of health during infancy. Uh, and it's one of the first questions we ask. How much did your baby weigh? What did he weigh? What did she weigh? And it's not that we're being nosy, really. Well, maybe we are just a little. But it's an exciting thing to share the how long your baby was and how much they weighed. So it's really an excellent indicator that that's a healthy baby, too. Birth weight doubles. Ding, 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 ding. Six months, six months, six months. Remember that. Six months. The average weight of a six-month-old is 16 pounds or 7.3 kilograms. 
They will gain five to seven ounces weekly until approximately five to six months. When do they triple? Triple, triple, triple their weight by one year. Triples by one year. Triples by one year. So double six months, triples by a year. With an average weight at one year of 21.5 pounds or 9.75 kilograms. Now can you imagine doing that in this day and time? Thank goodness we don't triple uh, our weight in one year. Or at least I hope we don't. All right, as far as when weight quadruples, it quadruples by two to two and a half. And from three to six uh, to the adolescent growth spurt, and if you'll remember earlier, uh, when we looked at concepts, we said 4.4 to six pounds per year. Now we're saying four to six pounds per year. That's because your book's contraindicating itself as well. So if you will just remember from three years old to the adolescent growth spurt, they should be gaining about four to six pounds per year. You'll be fine. Weight gain in, in formula-fed infants is slightly greater than breastfed infants, and sometimes we tend to overfeed our formula-fed uh, infants. All right, when we're looking at height, if you'll remember, 2.5 centimeters is one inch, and we've already been over this in concepts, but review, review, repetition is the mother of all learning. Uh, one inch is 2.5 centimeters for the first six months, one half inch or 1.25 centimeters for the second six months. So if you remember, you could add nine from their birth length to one year to about how long they should be. The average height at six months is 25 and a half inches, and at 12 months is 29 inches. Uh, I talked about a measuring board when I talked about how the best way to measure an infant when I talked about concepts, and there's an actual picture in your book. Let me make sure it still is on page 110. Let me get over to 110. And there he is. So if you look on page 110, it shows you how to how you would use um, the measuring board. It also talks shows you how to weigh an infant on page 111. All right, looking at the head uh, growth during the first six months, head circumference increases up to 1.5 centimeters or 0 0.6 inches a month but it decreases to only 0 0.5 centimeters or 0 0.2 inches during the second six months, which is good. We don't want they to keep grow, grow, growing. So that the average circumference at six months is 17 inches or 43 centimeters. The average circumference at 12 months is 18 inches or 46 centimeters. By one year of age, the head size has increased to the chest size. So. What does the expanding head size reflect? Well, that reflects that increase in brain growth. If you can remember back in concepts, we said that brain is really, really growing that first year. And that's why uh, that head size is also increasing to allow for that growth. So how do we measure head circumference? It talks about that on page 124 in your book. It talks about uh, measuring of head circumference. Uh, and that's a very important thing that we want to make sure uh, that we are measuring correctly when we are measuring uh, the head circumference. Um, let me look here. No, sorry, I lied. So I'm back on page 110 again. It talks about how to measure that. And it shows you actually on page 110 and 111 on um, actually the measurement of the head circumference, and it shows you where they are actually uh, putting the tape measures to measure the head, the chest, and the abdominal circumference and where it would be uh, placed on the child. And then it explains it in detail on page 111. Sorry about that. So, how do we measure head circumference? Do we use paper tape measures? Do we use cloth? Uh, what type? And tape is the best, the kind that you get rid of, because cloth tends to stretch over time, uh, and it loses some of its uh, elasticity over time. So you really don't want to use the cloth ones. All right, and another ding, 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 ding. You need to know this, need to know this alert. When does the posterior fontanelle close? And if you said by six to eight weeks or about two months, you are correct. This is the triangular one that's between the sagittal and the lymboidal sutures, and it's only about one centimeter long, so it's not going to take that long to close.
The anterior font now fuses by 18 months. Now it's a lot larger. It's your diamond shape when it's between the sagittal and corneal sutures. This one on the other hand is about two to three centimeters wide and three to four centimeters long. Now we know the brain has increased its weight two and a half times in that first year, going from 25% at birth to 66% by the end of the first year. So lots of brain growth has occurred, so that's why we have to have some opening room there. So what can you tell by looking at the font nails? A lot. If they're bulging, that could be caused by increased intracranial pressure. If they're depressed or sunken, dehydration. Uh, they really are very tough. Most of us say, oh, don't touch their soft spot, don't touch their soft spot. But really, they're tough. They're like canvas. I mean, you would really have to get rough to hurt them. I'm not saying going around trying to do that. Uh, and it is better to keep children away from them because we don't want them damaging their soft spot. But they are pretty, pretty tough. Uh, they should be flat and smooth if they are normal. All right, maturation of body system, the eyes and the vision. The eyes uh, at birth are about half to three-fourth adult size, and acuity is about 2,100 at birth. By age 2, 20 to 40, and then 20 to 30. Pupillary and corneal reflexes are present at birth. And the infant, though, cannot integrate their head and eye movements well. They have what's called the doll's eye reflex, for one thing. And uh, because of the doll's eye reflex, and it talks about the reflexes on page 198 in your book if you need to read up on that. This is when the head lags behind if the head's rotated to one side. So you'd rotate the head to the side and the eyes would lag behind before they came on over. That fades within about one month and by four to six weeks, your doll's eye is poof, gone. Infants usually show a preference for high contrast colors. Not sure how they figured that out. Black and white and primary colors. No pastels in the room then before six months of age. Binocularity becomes important. This is the fixation of two ocular images into one. And the ability to fuse two images into one begins to develop about six weeks and is well established by four months. All right. Again, there's just an alert about things I just talked about. All right, hearing. Uh, acuity is at adult levels during infancy. By four months, they should actually be turning their eyes and head towards the sound, even if it's coming from behind. And by 10 months, they should be responding to the sound of their name. Respiratory system, very important to remember this. Respiratory rate does slow somewhat during infancy, but respiratory movements continue to be abdominal breathing. So abdominal breathing is normal for children. Actually, it's normal up to the age of seven. And that's because the intercostal muscles are still immature till that age. The lumen of the trachea and the bronchi enlarges, but remains small in comparison to the total size of the lungs. That means they have their volume of dead spaces quite large. That's why if we were to percuss over their lungs, instead of hearing resonance, we would hear hyperresonance because of that increased dead space. The chest assumes a more adult-like contour as they get older. The infant actually has to breathe about twice as fast as an adult because of that larger dead space, so that's why they have a higher respiratory rate. Respiratory infections. Well, there are factors that predispose an infant to more frequent and more severe respiratory infections. One is their short, straight eustachian tubes. That's going to allow infection to easily move from the throat to the middle of the ear. That's a straight line there. And as they get older, that becomes more slanted, and you do not see that as much. The small lumen of the trachea and bronchi can be easily blocked from inflammation and aspiration. Number two, the small lumen of the trachea and bronchi can, beca can become easily blocked from inflammation and aspiration. Actually, the diameter of an infant's airway, if you think about it, is about four millimeters in contrast to an adult's that's about 20 millimeters. So you can say four millimeters about the size of a drinking straw. So now you know why it doesn't take much to clog them up. And third, finally, the immature immune response of what we call IgA, the mucosal lining that lives in the respiratory tract. Now the benefit of IgA is that IgA has lots of antiviral effects. 
So if you don't have that antibody fully developed that's helping fighting against viruses, then they are going to continue to get more respiratory infections, particularly viral. All right, the circulatory system. Heart rate's now slowing down during infancy because the heart size is doubling now in size and weight. So it's getting more muscle and it's contracting better. Uh, newborns, you know, about 80 to 180, average 140. Uh, 12 months, uh, anywhere from 70 to 150. But if you just go by that mnemonic of 140, uh, then you'll be okay. Uh, rhythm is frequently what we call sinus arrhythmia. And that's where the rate increases with inspiration and decreases with expiration. Now that's very important to know and it's most obvious during sleep because for the new novice nurse they go in to check their heart rate and it's speeding up, slowing down, speeding up and slowing down with inspiration and expiration. That may freak them out a little bit and that's just normal and it's called sinus arrhythmia and that's normal through uh, infancy. The size of the heart is about 55% the width of the chest at this time. Now looking at the systolic blood pressure is beginning to rise and that's a result of the increased ability of the left ventricle to pump blood now to our systemic system. Uh, blood pressure is relatively low during infancy and there are some charts again to go by in the back of the book but if you remember that little thing that I told you to help you will be fine. Uh, fetal hemoglobin is present for the first five months, but we know that fetal hemoglobin is not as capable of producing mature red blood cells. So they can get what's called physiological anemia, particularly between two and three months of age. Fetal hemoglobin is totally converted to from fetal to adult at five to six months of age, so you should not see that during that time, that physiological anemia. Uh, maternal iron stores are starting to diminish from month to month too as we go, so you have to be careful to make sure they are getting iron in the diet. Digestive system, a majority of the digestive uh, processes do not begin until about three months. We know amylase is present in just small amounts in the mouth, so it has little effect on food and it doesn't stay in the mouth long enough. They're mostly taken in liquid that's going in and going down. Gastric digestion consists primarily of hydrochloric acid and what we call renin. Now if you look down at the bottom there, it tells you renin is an enzyme that acts on the casein in milk to cause the formation of curds so that the milk will actually stay in the stomach long enough to be digested. So very important that they have enough hydrochloric acid and renin. During infancy, the mean maturity of the digestive system is evident in the appearance in their stools. So from six months to 12 months, if you're feeding them whole peas, corns, and carrots, when you open the diaper, you might get see whole peas, carrots, and uh, peas, particularly corn. Corn is hard for adults to digest. All right, it's not until the second year, uh, the end of, not until the second year that the more fibrous foods can be completely digested. So you don't want to feed them some foods too early. Um, as we get over older, peristaltic activity is going to increase because we're getting more and more food in there. Bowel evacuation is going to remain involuntary until myelinization of the spinal cord is complete, and that's about 14 to 18 months. Now, uh, during this time of all of your organs, the liver is the most immature of your GI organs throughout infancy. All right, what about dentation or teeth? We know the first set of teeth to erupt are the, and we've already been over this, Lower central incisors. Now that's normal. If you got your uppers first, you're okay. You're just special. And when do you get these? Dun, 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 dun. Six to eight months. Remember, it can be anywhere between four to 12, but the average is six to eight months. The second set of teeth, the upper central incisors, are the second ones to come in, and they're usually between seven and eight months. The primary teeth are usually completed by two and a half years. Calcification is complete by three. When you finish, uh, you have uh, 32 secondary teeth and 20 primary. So you have 20 baby teeth, and when you finish in adulthood, you end up with 32. So you cram a lot more teeth in there. Page uh, 325 in your book. Get over there. I got sticky fingers today. That won't do nothing. 325 shows you an excellent uh, picture of the sequence of eruption of your primary teeth. 
All right, so if you're getting teeth that young, you need some anticipatory guidance. Teething uh, does cause discomfort to many infants. We know that drooling is common during this time and it's normal. The saliva is being produced, but the infant has not yet learned to swallow it. Discomfort uh, is often evident and they can become irritable. They can rub their gums a lot. Uh, they have a desire to bite. Their gums may become red and swollen. Uh, teething rings become very beneficial. Some teething lotions, though, contain alcohol, so be very, very careful about that. So guidelines for teaching parents about teething. Do not belittle the parents for their beliefs or concerns, but you do have to discourage some home remedies. Others are not. So if they are not potentially harmful, it's okay. If they are, then discourage them. No, we should not be going around putting an aspirin on a baby's gums. We should not go around and putting um, whiskey on their gums. Um, one of the things you want to remember from here on out uh, from pediatrics is the normal dose of Tylenol to give. Tylenol, 10 to 15 milligrams per kilogram every four hours is the normal dose. Tylenol, 10 to 15 milligrams per kilogram every four hours is the normal dose. The practice of again, things like placing aspirin is uh, discouraged. Not only could they choke, it also causes gum disease and damage and can be aspirated. And we know aspirins are no-no in children less than 11 anyways because it can be linked to what we call Rye syndrome. All right, the renal system. The immaturity of the renal system this time predisposes the infant to dehydration. If they can't concentrate the urine effectively, it's going to go out. Urine is avoided frequently and has a very low Pacific gravity. If you look at the Pacific gravity there of 1.000 to 1.010, that's almost the specific gravity of water. Complete maturity of the kidneys is not going to occur until the latter half of the second year, so it takes a while. Psychosocially, for the infant, they are in Erickson's trust versus mistrust, birth to one year. After one year, they go to the next stage. The trust at, up to one year. The day they turn one, they go to the next stage. The trust acquired in infancy, they say, is the foundation for your succeeding in other phases. But it doesn't mean you get to skip the next phase. You keep on going. The critical element for achievement during this time is the quality of the caregiver relationship. Now, Erickson divided the first year of life into three social modalities, and it centers all around the mouth. The first is the oral. They are primarily narcissism, which means total concern for oneself. When they let out the cry and they want the bottle, they want it yesterday. Grasping, they're reaching out to others. They'll do a lot of finger grasping, and you think that's so cool when they're holding on to your finger. Biting, a sense of control, and that is one of the first conflicts that we see. You have a breastfed infant who starts biting a lot, then we we start uh, learning that if you bite too much, you will not get what you want. So all of these, he said, Erickson's important to the infant for developing a sense of trust, that they have to have go through the oral, the grasping, and the biting stages. Now, according to Piaget, uh, Piaget said the first phase we know is sensory motor, birth to 24, and he says there's three uh, crucial events that take place. The infant uses symbols. Object permanence begins. And when does it begin? Dun, da, 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 six to eight months. So if I was in doubt on the test, I would pick six to eight months. Hint, hint. It's usually well developed by nine months. And also something called separation anxiety that we'll talk about. As far as the use of symbols, you can see symbols nipple equals milk, bottle equals milk. They begin to associate certain symbols. Uh, page 330 in your book talks about object permanence, and you can look over that. Uh, that is when you put something under the, I say 330, maybe on 319. Let me look here, sorry. I'm sorry, it's on page 319 in your book. Yeah, just ignore that. Wrong page number, my bad. On 319. And it talks about that being well developed by nine months. Object permanence is when you put something under the pillow and they actually search for it because they know it not, did not disappear. Before that time, if you put something under there, they don't look for it because they think it went away for good. Uh, that's very important when we're talking about parents. 
object permanence. They know when they leave the room, they're coming back. So it is something that they need to develop and develop well. Wake up alert, wake up alert. Think about one thing you've learned so far. Yep, tell me out loud even though I can't hear you. It will help. What was the normal dose of Tylenol? If you didn't automatically think 10 to 15 milligrams per kilogram every four hours, you need a wake up alert. All right, adaptive behaviors. These are behaviors that can be classified as gross motor, fine motor, language, and uh, personal development and social. So looking at gross motor or skills, um, if you look on page 316, there's a good visual. First of all, it talks about head control. And it talks about uh, the newborn uh, head control. And it shows you some cute, cute pictures. So look at figure 10-2 with me on 316. On head control, you can see the newborn can turn their head from side to side when prone. They can lift their head momentarily, but they have what's called marked head lag from lying to sitting position. And if you look there on page 316, head control while sitting to a sitting position, a complete head lag at one month. You can see that baby, when you pull them up just by their arms, cannot control the muscles in the head to neck. They are too weak and it just falls back. By two to three months, they, they hold their head more erect. They can still bobble some, but only have slight head lag. And that's what you see there in figure B. Figure C shows you an infant at four months, and you can see now head control is well established. So by four months, it should be well, uh, well established, and by six months at the latest. So four to six months. If a child has not gained head control well by six months, they need a complete neurological workup. Something is not correct. And it talks about that more on the nursing alert on page 316. Rolling over. Well, by two months, they can roll from back to side. Five months, they can turn from their abdomen to their back. From six months, they can turn from their back to their abdomen. And seven months, they have what's called the parachute reflex that's appeared. All right, let's look at page 317. 317, in the top of page 317, shows you the parachute reflex. As the baby's going down, they're going to put their head, their hands downward. Let's talk about sitting. We've got some cute pictures of some babies sitting on page uh, 317. You can see at one to two months, they have no ability to sit upright. That's what we see in figure A. You put them up and they go clerplum. At four months, they can only sit with support only. Sit with support only. You can see at six to seven months, they can sit alone leaning on their hands. That would be figure D. And then by seven to eight months, they can sit well unsupported, and that is figure E. By 10 months, they should be able to maneuver from a prone to a sitting position. So you do need to know these. All right, let's look at locomotion on page 318. Six to seven months, they're able to bear all or his or her weight. Okay. And you can see there it's showing a picture of an infant bearing their full weight at seven months on figure A. By nine months, they can stand holding to furniture, figure B and C. Ten months, they are crawling well and steps with one foot. So they're able to crawl well and step with one foot. By 11 months, they can walk holding to the furniture. It's what I call cruising. They're cruising the furniture back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. At 12 months, they can walk, but they have to usually have one hand, hand held. And by 14 months, the average infant should be walking well. Also on page 318, it shows you about crawling and creeping at age 9 months. Okay. There's also a um, nursing alert on page uh, 317 that says an infant who does not pull to a standing position by 11 to 12 months of age Again, needs further evaluation for possible developmental dysplasia of the hip. That's why it's important you know these norms of growth and development. If you do not know what is normal, then you absolutely can know what, not know what's abnormal and at what age. Fine motor development. This involves hand-eye coordination. 
Things such as grasping that occurs during the first two to three months as a reflex gradually becomes voluntarily. At one month, their hands are predominantly closed. So if you look at a picture of an infant uh, on a, anywhere taking pictures, a lot of times their hand will be closed. By three months, though, their hands are mostly open. And by four months, they develop what's called hand regard. They develop what call it hand regard. And hand regard is simply looking at an object, eyeballing it, looking at the hand. Looking at an object, eyeballing it, looking at the hand. They know there's a connection, but they haven't connected it in their brain yet how quite to do it and grasp it. All right, at five months, they have a voluntary, they can voluntarily grasp an object. At six months, they should be able to hold his or her bottle. At um, seven months, they can transfer objects from one hand to the other. At eight to 10 months, they have what's called the crude pincer grasp versus the um, neat pincer grasp. And it talks about that in your book as well. And it's not, I don't believe, on 325. I don't remember what page it is. Evidently, I'm wrong, the wrong page number down again. But it talks about grasping in your book, uh, and you can look that up. But what these are, I will describe the crude versus uh, the pincer grasp, the neat. The crude pincer grasp is at 8 to 10 months. And what that is, if, if I was to put an object down, the infant would take their whole hand and try to grasp that object. But when they get 11 months and they get the neat pincer grasp, they have learned to use their thumb and their forefinger to grasp the object so that it's a neat pincer grasp and they can pick it up easier. So that when they get ready to do that, now they're actually able to put objects in a container and start removing them because they have that neat pincer grasp now. By 12 months, they can try to build a tower of two blocks, but they usually fail. All right, this is where I'm going to end uh, on the language development, and then I will pick back up for part two uh, here. All righty then.